Good evening, and welcome to the Institute of Politics. My name is Steve Grand, and I chair the student program here at the Institute. One of our programs, of which we are most proud in the student committee, is our Visiting Fellows program. In the tradition of bringing prominent people from the world of politics to the Institute and to Harvard, we bring to you our speaker tonight. Ed Asner began his career as a college student at the University of Chicago and has since appeared in numerous plays in Chicago in the Playwrights Theater Club and in both on and off Broadway plays in New York. His career includes both movies and television guest star appearances in shows such as Ironsides, the FBI, and Medical Center. Television viewers know him best for his role as Lou Grant <laughs> on the Mary Tyler Moore Show from 1970 to 1977 and the Lou Grant Show from 1977 to 1982. His acting awards include Emmys for Mary Tyler Moore Show, Rich Man, Poor Man, Roots, and The Lou Grant Show, and also Be Best Actor Awards from the Critics Circle for Roots and The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Mr. Asner has been described by the press alternately as a huggable teddy bear <laughs> and a gruff man of action. I haven't, I haven't hugged him yet, nor have I found him gruff, but he is a man of action in the world of politics. Reading from his bio, Mr. Asner has espoused causes such as medical aid for El Salvador, stumping for political candidates, and the nuclear freeze. One of his biggest interests since his early auto worker days has been the union cause. Last year, combining his devotion to acting and to unions, Mr. Asner threw his hat into the ring and in November of 1981, a record turnout of SAG members voted him the 18th president of the Screen Actors Guild. The students and others involved with his visit to Harvard have a rare opportunity to meet a man who both has the background, talents, and commitment of Mr. Asner and who knows Mary Tyler Moore personally. <laughs> he is a passionately sincere, devoted, and articulate man and it is a great pleasure to introduce and welcome to the Institute, speaking on the topic, Television is Public Policy, Mr. Edward Asner. Thank you for that um, double introduction. I, um, uh, I wasn't sure if I heard Steve correctly when he said uh, reading from Mr. Asner's bile or bio. <laughs> Gonna work on that diction. <laughs> and when he said I threw my hat into the ring, I suffered enormously from the exposure. <laughs> A special thanks to everyone connected with the Institute of Politics and those who arranged for me to be with you here tonight. It's wonderful to be with the young people of New England. Around here, you're, you're different from the folks back in L.A. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, it, it's very hard for the Southern Californian to understand Thoreau. <laughs> How does a guy who lives beside a pond not own a power boat, water skis, and a wind sail. <laughs> we, we continually question that. But I, I'm not impressed by New England itself. Uh, the leaves outside are pretty, yeah, sure. <laughs> but we have fall in Los Angeles, too. The leaves turn gray, cough once, and fall. <laughs> Our two cities are similar in other ways, of course. Boston hosts the historic marathon every year, and now Los Angeles is getting ready for the Olympic Games next summer. And if you want to be smart, come to Los Angeles during the Olympics. That is the Winter Olympics in Helsinki. 
I'm honored and a little amazed to be selected as a visiting fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics, drafted maybe, honored to join the likes of Hyman Rickover, Dan Rather, and Giscard d'Estaing. Amazed that uh, Harvard could honor a chubby Midwestern junk dealer son of forceful opinion with a Harvard political fellowship. I can't tell if you've lowered the standards <laughs> or raised the hopes of the common man. <laughs> but much of the reason for my being here, and indeed for my success, rests with television. Oh, I've, I've made about 15 feature films. Uh, remember the immortal Kid Galahad with Elvis Presley? <laughs> Kid, you got more guts than anybody in history. Or El Dorado with the fabular Duke Wayne. Big guy, this town don't need no law and order. So far, I have not been immortalized in feature films. <laughs> and feature films are wonderful, creative playgrounds and forums for any actor. But a hit movie is seen by perhaps only seven million people. A smash Broadway play is seen by no more than a million. The nation's largest circulation newspaper is two million. Yet a TV program which reaches less than 30 million homes might be considered a failure. It is most certainly television that brings me here. It is television that organizes, directs, and molds our lives. David Halberstam calls television an instrument that has been both in overt and subliminal ways more important and dominant in our lives than newspapers, radio, or church, more important than family, more powerful than the government itself. What's that barely audible mumbling I hear? But I never watch television? Is that what I hear? You might be surprised, my friends, to learn that college graduates watch TV an average of two hours and 24 minutes a day. And if that sounds like a lot, consider that the average American watches nearly seven hours a day. Seven hours. That's a lot of reruns of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> I would submit that Gilligan's Island notwithstanding, all of this television watching adds up to a potent influence on public policy making in America. And I'm not talking about paid political announcements or nightly network news. The impact of these communications is already well established. What I'm driving at is that entertainment television can and does put issues on the public agenda. It mobilizes and gives support to special interest groups. And it very often changes the way we perceive our history and our culture. All of this is not to say that entertainment television is the exclusive force in shaping policies and opinions. I wouldn't go so far as to say that Charlie's Angels has contributed to our concerns over the arms race. Legs, maybe. <laughs> of course, policy formulation is a far more complex process. Yet in a society where more people watched the final episode of MASH than voted in the last presidential election, and where the best-selling magazine is TV Guide, Entertainment television can be, and I would say should be, a responsible means of establishing policy priorities and leading viewers to a better understanding of important ideas. 
In the words of one of my heroes, Edward R. Murrow, television is the instrument that can teach. It can illuminate, yes, and it can even inspire. But it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it to those ends. For example, the writers of Lou Grant would approach controversial aspects of everyday life, from sexual harassment to nuclear annihilation. We disclose the horrors of nursing homes, the fanaticism of religious sects, the difficulties Vietnam veterans have in assimilating to civilian life, and the poisoning of America by chem chemical companies' hazardous waste dumps. And that's in just one episode. We reached more than 30 million Americans each week with our message. We drew an involved, more affluent, and educated audience, and our influence was felt. I've been told that the cloakrooms of Congress were abuzz every Tuesday morning with talk of the issues raised in the previous evening's telecast of Lou Grant. On some occasions, broadcasts heightened public awareness and concern for important issues. In other cases, the impact is even more direct. The popular drama Quincy ran two separate episodes on so-called orphan drugs. These are drugs used for such rare conditions as Tourette's syndrome, which a friend of my son's has, which affects so few people that the drug companies couldn't make a buck out of it, and therefore they don't like to make them. The two shows, coupled with Jack Klugman's and my testimony before a congressional committee, were in large part responsible for the enactment of an orphan drug bill last year. Yet another example, also on Quincy, a story of a Downs syndrome boy portrayed beautifully by a person with Down syndrome that took on the issue of a doctor's decision to let a newborn with Downs die after withholding medical treatment. Out of that show came the recent baby doe decision in Indiana preventing doctors from withholding vital care. One of Lou Grant's proudest moments was our episode which underscored the importance of the Freedom of Information Act. Combined with my congressional testimony on the subject, I'd like to believe we contributed in some small way to preventing the gutting of this essential legislation. I'm delighted to say that we have a Freedom of Information Act in Los Angeles now. Shows such as Lou Grant and Quincy not to mention All in the Family, MASH, Hill Street Blues, and a host of made-for-television movies have been able to take up important issues and have real impact, while still being quite, quite entertaining. In the case of Lou Grant, judging from our cancellation, maybe not quite entertaining enough. On the other hand, it's a sure bet that shows like Three's Company are not going to stir viewers to action above the waistline anyway. <laughs> Audible. <laughs> I love the movie War Games, and I only hope the TV show it inspired, Whiz Kids, follows in its footsteps. I just have a hunch that if your generation, instead of mine, were in control of our computerized arsenal, the likelihood of a nuclear war would be greatly diminished. The influence of the medium is certainly pervasive. Today's movie stars are TV alumni. Rawhide brought us Clint Eastwood, Laugh-In gave us Goldie Hawn, John Travolta owes his success to Welcome Back Cotter, Burt Reynolds was initially Detective Dan August. 
and I even remember him before that as a blacksmith on Gunsmoke. And with your continued devotion and support, me, 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 Uh, that sobers me up. <laughs> and it is a sobering thought that by age 16, the average child has watched 15,000 hours of television, more time than he or she has spent in school. Some argue, however, that this is not necessarily bad. In 1977, Newsweek suggested that in general, the children of television enjoy a more sophisticated knowledge of a far larger world at a much younger age. On the flip side is what Howard Beals told us in Network. You're beginning to think the tube is reality and your own lives are unreal. This is mass madness. Take, for example, that crime on television occurs at 10 times the rate that it does in real life. 55% of prime time characters are involved in one crime each episode. The result of that, nearly half of heavy TV viewers, when polled, said they believe their neighborhoods and society are unsafe full of danger and mean strangers. But only about 25% of light television viewers had this fearful perspective. Such inaccurate perceptions lead viewers to believe that problems can be solved in 30 minutes or even 30 seconds. When they can't, we become a little frustrated. At present in, in, uh, in Hollywood and throughout the, the movie producing world, we are involved with a different form of affirmative action. We hope to implement and find the way to get producers working with us to begin presenting the American scene as it truly exists with people of color with sufficient women who are a majority dominating the screen, with the aged and the aged seen in a proper perspective, in a useful utilitarian perspective, and with the disabled who probably are the most slandered, libeled of all groups and rarely if ever presented in their truly active, useful light. That too is truth, and we are aiming at it. We hope to strive and achieve it, but we'll need a lot of help because that is part of the educational process. So what we have is the premise that entertainment television, whether it's good or bad, is a powerful force, and that any program seen by enough people for a long enough time can channel the course of public policy. And if you believe that television has become the dark side of the force, then what do we do about television in America? Before I suggest some choices, I must infuse this discussion with the reality that the television business is a business. After all, where would we be without the essentials of life, such as, are you hungry for a Burger King now? You deserve a break today at McDonald's, or I'm a pepper, you're a pepper, be a pepper now. <laughs> Frank Mankiewicz accurately observed that the men and women who control television are animated by little more than a simple search for profits. They are neither good or bad people, but only good or bad businessmen. But that doesn't mean what comes between commercials for Prel Concentrate and John Hausman's espousals need be vacuous or banal. The purists in the audience would probably intone that shows like the Holocaust are pap. 
nothing more than nighttime soap operas. And compared to probably one of the best historical documentaries ever made, Worlds at War, hosted by Laurence Olivier, they would be right. But Worlds at War garnered only a few hundred thousand viewers. And in the showing of Holocaust, millions upon millions of viewers became apprised, many for the first time, of this dark episode in our history. Sometimes you have to walk before you can run, especially when you've been crawling until now. So we have a few options for the educated American community to exert a positive influence on television programming. First, take more interest in the quality shows on the air to boost their all-important ratings and encourage, wherever you can, your friends, strangers, if necessary, to do likewise. And let the networks and advertisers know if you like a show. Just as a small veto group can often scare sponsors away from a program, thoughtful support can often save a beleaguered show. With spiraling costs of production and intensified rating wars, networks are tending to give new shows an ever shorter lease on life in the face of low numbers. If All in the Family were premiered this season with the ratings it garnered the first time out, it would now be in the sitcom junk heap with the likes of Hello, Larry. You may wish to bear in mind the words of one CBS programming vice president. I'm not interested in culture. I'm not interested in pro-social values. I have only one interest. That's whether people watch the program. That's my definition of good. That's my definition of bad. Second, modify the network's rating system to reflect the true interests and intelligence of our citizens. To a large degree, market forces may take care of this. Network viewership is on the decline as competing forms of home entertainment take hold. Cable, pay TV, video cassettes all allow viewers to become their own programmers. Consequently, networks won't be able to take their audiences for granted. This is not to mention syndicated television, which has also made great inroads on the networks. Something more than the $1.98 beauty contest is going to be required of them. Third, networks and producers should people their organizations with bright young people, such as yourselves, who have a point of view and aren't afraid, or at least I hope you're not afraid, to express it. Responsible, creative ideas that are well executed and attract an audience will spawn more such programming. Of course, all this depends on you getting into the television game, business, art, call it what you will. But it's a hell of a life. Think about it. And they need you. Finally, and most importantly, don't dismiss network television as the opiate of the middle classes. If you do, then you resign yourself to television's version to television's version of ideals and values. Let's transmate, translate America's love affair with television into a way to uplift and to educate, all while entertaining. Now, you've, you've told yourself, and you're probably telling me, great, Ed, go ahead. Dump television's mediocrity on us and walk away. What are you going to do to move mountains? Well, I could agree with Adlai Stevenson that the sound of tireless voices is the price we pay 
for the right to hear the music of our own opinions and step aside. But I won't. Instead, my contribution is ongoing and modest. Beyond my own energy and opinions is my profession. I choose to apply my work to such stories as Roots and The Gathering to make a statement. But my involvement alone doesn't move mountains. It uh, only satisfies my need for seeking social change. Real movement must come from you. If thoughtful, well-educated Americans become active participants in broadcast television, we don't have to stand by as television swallows up our freedoms, individuality, and self-expression. If not, we can expect to see more of the same. Public policy will continue to be more a reflection of Mr. Smith and Mr. T than Ralph Nader or Izzy Stone. And Ronald Reagan will reaffirm his belief that women desire the shallow life of Sue Ellen Ewing. Oh, you know her, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that E.B. White fully realized how on target he would be when he wrote in The New Yorker in 1938, I believe television is going to be the test of the modern world, and that in this new opportunity to see beyond the range of our vision, we shall discover either a new and unbearable disturbance of the general peace or a saving radiance in the sky. We shall stand or fall by television. Of that, I'm quite sure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, Mr. Asner will now field a few questions. If you're, um, especially up upstairs there, if you can wave your arms pretty wildly and speak loudly. All right. Uh, to save time, why don't I, you know, just try to move up through the tiers and be sure I don't ignore you. Yes. Do we have two hours <laughs> for openers? Um, my, uh, my presidency had nothing to do with the award uh, not being given to President Reagan. That was a decision made by the board of the Screen Actors Guild, which uh, uh, comes to a total of 90 individuals, and uh, they made their decision not to give that award uh, as the awards committee. They overruled the awards committee. In terms of uh, Lou Grant, um, I believe that um, my participation in medical aid for El Salvador and the subsequent outcry over that uh, led to the um, lead, including boycotts, led to the cancellation of the show. So I feel it was a political decision that did it. Okay, fine. Uh, Steve has said, have you come to the microphones, I gather they're set up there, that are set up to ask questions. That way, I guess everybody can hear you ask the questions. Where is the microphone here? I see. And are they upstairs too? Okay. Uh, next, next. Uh, where's your microphone? 
It's unoccupied. Moving right along. Anybody up there? Yeah, okay. All right, ask your question. Were you with the Right Stuff premiere? If so, what did you think of it? If not, why didn't you go? <laughs> I never received my orders. No, I was not at the premiere. Where was it? In Hollywood? Why, why would I be there? <laughs> what? President of SAG. What's that got to do with the premiere? Well, nah. nah. <laughs> We're uh, uh, only only when they need us to testify in Congress uh, are are the union presidents asked by the industry to step forward. <laughs> That's about the only time. Yes. I've got about half a dozen, but let's see. Um, <laughs> well, until she's challenged for the position, go ahead. OK. Um, have you had any trouble getting work since the cancellation of Lou Grant? That's one. And an adjunct question to that is, do you believe that today there is a Hollywood and media blacklist of political activists? I um, uh, tend to think not. Uh, I, would, I would say that the embarrassment that um, the echoes from the, from the 50s created, if the blacklist is to take place, they have to figure out a much cleverer means or a much more authoritarian means of uh, achieving it. Uh, as one producer who was offered my services the week after Lou Grant was canceled, I think I was too hot to handle at the time, and his response when I was suggested to him was, I think he would be a political liability. Uh, I think if I had been in the man's position, I probably would have said the same thing at the time. Uh, I have worked since then. I don't think I'm being blacklisted. Uh, as a matter of fact, you should be home tonight watching me on Showtime <laughs> if this was an advanced stage of civilization here and you had Showtime. But uh, I'm doing... You don't have Showtime. <laughs> it is on Showtime tonight in uh, in one of in some of your rural areas, I believe, <laughs> and um, and uh, 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 on it, and it will be repeated, so you can hurry up and get Showtime to move into your neighborhoods. Uh, I, I appear with Dan Trevani in a *Case of Libel*, the wonderful Henry Denker play, over Westbrook Pegler, Quentin Reynolds, and uh, that Louis Neiser prosecuted or pursued. Um, but uh, uh, I, I did Daniel, I did um, The Case of Libel, and in November uh, or January, in a very healthy period of watching, uh, you can see me in a two-hour movie of uh, Norman Cousins' Conquest over Ankylosing Spondylitis, uh, Anatomy of an Illness. And that's on that Queen Mother of the Airwaves, CBS. God love you. <laughs> What's it like in steerage? <laughs> you <have an> <laughs> um, You're Chinese too? Yes. That's why we've been talking for five minutes. <laughs> As soon as we bring his murderers to justice, we'll know. Uh, 
Um. 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 Hi. Second tier. It's about time the second tier spoke up. <laughs> Do you feel that television may become analogous to the Soma of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World? Oh, I don't think so. Look at me. <laughs> But you act on you. television. You don't watch all that much, do no, you? No, I don't. Do you? No. How much do you watch? I watch perhaps half an hour a week or less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God you finally got some sisses. Uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, I think that, um, uh, granted, the more you look at it, the more you despair uh, as to where are those golden moments I used to watch? And I forget about me. Uh, they were gold, oh. though. Um, uh, I think of you know I, th I think of the past, and, and I, I I must say I'm on the run now, and I I my, my life is too hectic uh, uh, to watch regularly. But um, I um, I think that uh, we are in a transition period with television right now, and I think it sucks, but um, I, I think it will improve uh, when this transition period is over with or during the course of it. But it needs your brickbats. Your brickbats certainly helped in the past, and they are needed now. Uh, this um, young girl down here is, uh, is busied with uh, action for children's television. and. Um, she knocked the poop out of certain programmers with uh, statements that they came out with recently on the Saturday morning cartoon programs being 30-minute commercials for the little heroes of each one and their eventual resolution into toys to be sold throughout the toy stores for all the little kitties to go buy. Well, that's direct action. Uh, if you want to affect just a little bit, Support action for children's programming. Second tier. Second tier. Yes. I'm interested, particularly as our programming is going on to an international level, what legislation or roles you feel the government should play domestically, but as systems come into uh, countries all over, what you feel those roles should be in an international perspective. I'm sorry. It, it came across okay. slightly garbled to me. Could you repeat it? The mic it? is high. Okay. I'm interested what roles you feel the government should play in terms of legislating communication and its programming, particularly domestically, but also as communication systems are going internationally and our program is being our programming is being offered to countries around the world. If you feel the government should take a stand in that and intervene in what is happening. But those programs have been sold for centuries already. Every one of the shows I have done is played in every foreign land you can find. Mary Tyler Moore, Lou Grant is a big hit in England at eleven thirty at night. Uh, if, if uh, legis I mean, I don't see any need for legislation concerning those shows in the past. They are being sold as entertainment. I have been receiving $5 residuals from them. What, uh, uh, and, and this, is, of course, is an area, this is an area that I didn't even touch upon in my speech. But this is, this is the golden moment, because we fail to re realize this, that all of this stuff we make, is spread throughout the world. You are known to Europeans primarily as to what they see of you on television. And if you want them to think of you as a Charlie's angel, that's up to you. <laughs> but but uh, uh, everything we do with our great God television has such ripples on the pond of the world, they are unbelievable. And uh, um, we must really begin to think about the image. I believe it was some Russian leader, maybe Stalin, uh, who said if he, uh, if he controlled Hollywood, he, can, he could control the world. Well, I think that with what takes place in film and television in this country, it does create one of our strongest controls of the world. Whatever world we control, that it comes from there. And I would go on to say, that our uh, trade balance, one of the few things offsetting our deficit in trade balance, <coughs> comes from the money brought into this country 
to the sale of our films. It's, it's been one of the bright spots in this gloomy past decade of receding uh, uh, pluses. So um, it's, it, it affects all of us. And what you do is carried through those varied means of communications and spread throughout the world, either in television or, or in some small way through some movie. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, you touched a little bit on my question, your answer to the previous uh, questioner over there, but do you think that blacklisting could ever recur again, perhaps especially in soap operas or programs like that, which are usually owned or often owned outright by a sponsor and just packaged or mar marketed to the network, or for that matter, any other kinds of television programs? No, I, I think that there is a... Um, I don't think... I think that, I don't know anything about soap operas, but I don't think that, uh, that the um, uh, blacklist aspect could occur there either. If it does occur, then it, um, uh, it occurs by um, making sure the performer doesn't get unruly. I think there's a much tighter control on the, uh, on the freedom of a performer in, uh, in soaps, and I think that they, um, uh, despite all the mail that might come in, they are made to toe the line much more severely, I believe, than nighttime entertainers. So you don't think it could recur again, in your opinion? Anything could occur again, given the authority. And it's up to us to see that such authoritarianism does not take place. Um, yeah, I'm very impressed with your um, commendable efforts to put public policy issues into entertainment television. And I'm pretty sure that in entertainment television, other than the ones that you've been involved with, there are equally um, powerful public policy messages being portrayed. How about your candid comments on the policy, mes um, policy messages being communicated through programs like, that are popular, like the A-Team and the Dukes of Hazard and Dynasty? These, are, these shows, I think, also carry <laughs> messages to the American public. Mm -hmm. And I think that they should be commented upon as they occur. <laughs> okay. Any comments about the motivations of producers? I read a study once that suggested that um, public policy issues come up in entertainment television, but then are always resolved in favor of the status quo. You get any sense of the way um I think that 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 you would have a much more difficult task attacking those negative aspects that you mentioned. Uh, one of them that has been assailed of late, I noticed, was that everywhere in uh, in soaps and in prime time, there's so damn much drinking going on and. Uh, Certain groups, I think, are uh, becoming activated to trying to create some change there. You must realize that there has been, uh, you know, I don't know a team, and I, I suppose that there's a, a lot of comical violence that supposedly takes place there. But uh, the reduction of violence uh, compared to what it used to be is enormous, and that came through public pressure on the networks. Uh, if the drinking thing amounts to, uh, to something, perhaps it will result in the same changes. But I don't think you're going to f have much luck on the subtle little negativisms that you make note of. I think it has to be a broader issue to attract attention. Yes. Since you're encouraging all of us to get involved in network television, uh, tell us a little bit about how it works and very specifically Lou Grant seemed not to simply air issues, but also often to take a stand. Where did that come from? What was the motivation? Who was behind that? And is it something that existed from the beginning, or did it develop along the line? I think it was the, the, um, the will and the consciences and, and uh, the minds of the creators. Two of the creators were the uh, original writers and producers, the Mary Tyler Moore, who did wonderful little bits of conscientious writing with Mary Tyler Moore in small ways, but effective ways. And when they got into the big picture of our television, serious, uh, a dra dramatic hour, uh, Gene Reynolds was, uh, came over from MASH 
and the Troika created a, uh, an hour-long drama of conscience that uh, dealt uh, with intelligent activities in an intelligent arena. So uh, brains and conscience, I would say, uh, are the first two re requisites. And I certainly was delighted that I didn't have to jump over speeding cars to excite my producer's interest. Yes, sir. Well, there are very many things one would like to ask about, like, for instance, the continued assault on fundamental constitutional freedoms, especially the right of the accused, which is portrayed as the right of the criminal in cop shows, where there's continual approval of police violations of constitutional rights uh, on the part of the producers and writers and makers of the show. But what I wanted to ask you about the thing that, that, that alarmed me most, though it is off your subject because it deals mainly with the treatment of news, <coughs> is of course it all traces back to the tremendous concentration of power over content that goes throughout television. But during the recent crisis over the downing of the Korean plane, 007. <coughs> it was really frightening to see how quickly a kind of war hysteria spread throughout the country. A war hysteria spread at other times and before we had television, yet seemed to go much more quickly this time. And you could see how selectively television worked. For instance, I heard over Channel 44 the statement of the Nigerian delegate to the United Nations who, while not condoning the attack, attributed such incidents to the growing tensions in the world and rather than seeing it as a way of mobilizing world opinion against the Soviet Union, saw it as a warning that to lead us to the reduction of tensions between the great powers, which I thought was an eminently sane reaction. What was frightening was that this kind of voice of reason <laughs> was completely omitted in any of the network news broadcasts. What I want to ask you is, do you see any way that people could organize, say church groups, political groups, to try to make their voices heard on this medium? I would recommend to you that you find some means of organization from this fine woman here who heads action on for children's television in finding the, the effective means of both organization and locating the jugular of the network. The network's jugular, that's good. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, I, I can't tell you other than the point is that you know time after time in, in public I hear this question addressed, how do we do it, how do we do it? And and in the end, people find it too awesome and say, oh, what's the use, what the hell? And no one ever starts by being the first pebble in the landslide. And it, you know, it's, if, if you can find another person to agree with you, you've, you've scored half the victory. And I think you'll find plenty here who do. Thank you, sir. Yes? Mr. Asner, a uh, particular social issue of which I am very much concerned is the issue of racism in our society today. Uh, we're being reminded of, that, reminded of that today currently in the mayoral race in the city of Boston, in which perhaps you already know for the first time in its history, one of the two candidates uh, in the final runoff for, for the mayor uh, is a black man. Uh, also this issue, or, th or the, the issue of racism is reflected in our foreign policy. Not only are we waging wars in areas such as Central America and, and Middle East against people of color, but also, more often than not, the American soldiers who wind up dying are, are often people of color. My, I'm interested in knowing what kind of actions and uh, organizing the Guild is doing, for example, in an effort to, to reverse this long-standing tendency in our society. The Guild has spoken out against racism in South Africa and is calling upon any and all performers to avoid appearing in South Africa. Uh, the Guild is not a political institution per se. It rarely involves itself. 
other than our affirmative action program, which would affect the presentation of the American scene as it truly exists, that is our prime function. In addition, in addition to policing the uh, the areas of work for our actors and seeing that they are properly policed, properly uh, uh, enforced, and that uh, uh, gains are constantly uh, made, both to in increase work, however we can do it, and to see that the work that is done I is done under our conditions. Um, the um, uh, the um, the country is getting smarter, and um, I would say we are all part of the process. And uh, by the country, I mean the people. Uh, unfortunately, I find um, Congress far too much a willing mistress to a president with whom they speak often of their disagreement, and yet they trundle along uh, in um, unwilling obedience to his desires. I would say that peace groups uh, must militate more strongly than ever in promoting peace candidates and in getting rid of hawks. Uh, getting back to your question about the guild, we do not involve ourselves politically. I would hope someday that we do. And firstly, I would hope that we do it in our own state, I in each individual state. Is there an effort going on to, uh, to encourage a better participation of these people on TV and, and participating in more positive and human roles uh, as examples to society? Is there any sort of campaigning such no, as that? No, there is not. And that is, a, that is an, an enormous, enormous task to ask a union to perform for, um, uh, for a union whose members are 85 percent of whom are unemployed at any given time. So that when the jobs come, uh, our people need them, want them. And uh, uh, I've turned down jobs in terms of conscience. And I would say that most actors have sufficiently high enough characters that they will do the same when they are approached with, uh, with such garbage. I, c I commend you for that. One action I would encourage people here to do in an effort to change some of this is in, on November 12th in Washington, there will be a demonstration protesting the current uh, United States policies and its intervention in Central America. And I would just encourage people to participate that in an effort to, to change this ugly element of our, of our society. Well, I would um, thank you for that. And I would say there is a march on Washington. And uh, if anybody here wants to um, find out about that, your, um, your local contact is 498-2198. Um, <laughs> And there's another number, 492-8699. And transportation, it says, is 354-0008. Yes? Yes, uh, Mr. Asner, um, I don't know if you watch the CBS Morning News or not, but no. last, last week, Charlton Heston was on it. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it kind of looked like uh, Ben-Hur versus lovable Lou Grant, more or less. You're and right on the last part. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, it seemed as uh, Ronald Reagan swept into office in 1980. Uh, along with Ronald Reagan was Charlton Heston and a lot of his ideas since they both agree. Now, I believe the most uh, liberal candidate running for president is Alan uh, Cranston of California. Uh, do you support Mr. Cranston and some of his ideas, and are you going to support a political candidate for president? Uh, I, as president of the, of the Guild, do not. As an individual, I have supported Alan Cranston for the past two months. <laughs> yes. Oh, there's a line foreman. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding of the official reason that Lou Grant was taken off the air was a, an alleged decline in the ratings. Um, my question is, what if people really don't watch? What if the programs that you or I would call intelligent educational programs aren't getting enough viewers? Um, there seems to be a certain appetite for Three's Company. What if you can't make the profit that you seem to have to make to legitimize a Lou, a Lou Grant? Well, I would hope that 
the although they're they haven't had too great an us uh, beginning this season I'm referring to NBC but the taste that uh, Grant Tinker has exercised uh, for the shows that uh, arose out of NBC in the past couple years, certainly by its overwhelming dominance in the Emmy Awards, reflects the taste of the network. And um, I would hope that within that framework, his stockholders think that uh, uh, they're not doing too badly at whatever position they're, they're making money. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be number one. And uh, once again, commend the network, commend the shows of that ilk that, uh, that strive for something beyond the mean. Well, given that commendation, do you think that's enough to prevail? I mean, who are all the people watching Three's Company? That's the mass American viewing public, I think. You know, it's making a call on the American viewer, I guess. I can't tell you not to watch Three's Company. That's yeah. up to you. And I would hope that... Uh, well, yeah, my question uh, is, do you think there are enough Lou Grant supporters, maybe? I, I do think, th I think there were at the time it was canceled. Do you think the numbers were massaged to a What's great that? extent? Were the numbers massaged to a great extent? No, the numbers were sufficient to keep it on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> yes. Ah. Um, I just have a question about. Box of Mars bars to that gentleman. <laughs> I have a question about what uh, appears to me. Um, maybe an undeserved optimism on your part about the, the manageability of changing the content of network television. Um, my question, I guess, has but to But you see, everything in our society is, con is responded to by people these days with that, the, the, the impossibility. And, and, and if you have the time and the willingness, then give it to organization. If you do nothing else in this life, organize to that capacity. I think... I think that's I think that's a commendable um, <laughs> goal. No, what I what my question had to do with was something that you brought up before about the unreality of what's on television. I think um, the unreality, not just in terms of the amount of crime vis-a-vis -vis the amount of crime in our normal lives, but also unreality in terms of the portrayal of the depth of of society and how what a limited range of things people you see on television, mm -hmm. and also the format itself being extremely limited and that. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how it got that way, in particular in light of certain people who write about, I guess, mass American culture, sociologists, social theorists, who um, view either television or other aspects of mass American culture as a kind of uh, homogenizing force, as um, an instrument, and I don't mean this in sort of a conspiratorial sense, not the government trying to do this, but an instrument um, in the hands of a, of a system to try and mold people into certain ways of thinking and the acceptance of certain kinds of values. Offending sort of the least possible number is another way of looking right, at and, it. Right, and, and sort of sustaining a certain kind of unidimensionality yeah. to the culture. And I was wondering if you, see my, my question about your optimism has to do with that. I mean, how is it that this, this instrument of mass culture got this way? And if, it, if there are strong forces that were moving it in that direction, then is it really conceivable that the, that the, that the commendable goals of uh, a certain group of people are, are going to change that without changing some of the underlying I think I think forces? that the potentiality for, for that change may well come by the diversity that may well take place on television through pay TV, through the, the, the increased power of syndication, uh, and the diminished dominance of the networks. There is an FCC ruling that is now being uh, considered to be uh, revoked. It's called prudent deregulation, which will tend to give back to the networks the power that they enjoyed in, uh, 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 prior to 1970, when, when production was taken out of their hands, when syndication was taken out of their hands. The, uh, Mark Fowler, the present chairman, is uh, hell-bent for leather to, uh, to uh, uh, take away this ruling and give it back to them. Now, the public doesn't understand this. Uh, uh, as bad as television is, I think it would be worse with the control of the networks. I think it would project uh, less diversity 
and I think that uh, it, would, uh, it would achieve less competition. And I think it is only competition within the field, greater competition than three networks that we can only hope to get away from that mediocrity that you speak of. Okay, um, I guess, okay, uh, I don't have time. Thank you. Jeff, I think we've got time for one more short question over there in the purple. <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask if you think that television program, programming is influenced at all by the current political power, the current the political party that's in power, and if so, how much? I don't know how much. I think it is, though. I think it is. I think that uh, there may be a certain joke that uh, might be in good, uh, in good taste on a comedy that might get shot down. I think that uh, um, certain bending to curry favor may take place on a particular show. I, 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 I think these things happen, but in very, very subtle ways, and I couldn't, I couldn't show you how. I, they do happen. Thank you. Thank you. You don't want to take the mic, sir? Oh, what is your question? Um, well, these people, uh, we'll get to them. All right. Three companies that are decent. You still talk about the nuclear family. In reality, the nuclear family does not exist in this country. The wife and husband are separated, the children are not. Uh, I'm appalled that the television network has these family programs that they have. There's no Ozzy Harriet. Not that we want the Nazi family, and we don't have any father knows that, the mother knows that. We don't have any together family. Now, television, as I understand it, is handed to the common sense, but also to help lead the common sense. You know? And that I don't see as television. I'm working now with a group of kids, 16, 15, 14 years old, who are taking hormones to. <laughs> <laughs> Applaud your involvement and the, the help that you render to them. Uh, television does what it can, I suppose, sporadically with the whatever occasional documentary may take place. Uh, I don't know how presenting a nuclear family is going to stop that, though. Yes. Yes, yes Mr. Asner. If you can ask it real quick, I'll answer them real quick, and we can wind up. Yeah, I was wondering if you can comment on the role in the future of uh, politically criticizing films in view of government intervention, such as uh, in the case of the award-winning film, If You Love This Planet. It got a great publicity, and I'm sure more people saw it with the publicity. Uh, so I, l let's hope that the government moves again and it once again is overruled on good stuff. As long as it's overruled. Huh? As long as it's overruled. As long as it's overruled, yeah. Last question? I wanted a few more details on your eviction from Lou Grant, in particular, who organized the pressure, if you know, what sponsors it was organized against, and if these are any groups that might respond to a counter-pressure campaign or counter-boycott. Uh, I would not, uh, I mean, the, the, the damage was done. I would, uh, I would call your attention merely to a, a few minor uh, rich people like Kimberly Clark and uh, uh, mm -hmm. Vidal uh, Sassoon and uh, Cadbury's chocolate, so that'll keep zits away. Yes. <laughs> we just want them not to think they can get away with it completely. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Student Advisory Committee and the Institute, we'd like to thank Mr. Asner for his comments this evening for spending a few days with us here at the Institute. Thanks for coming. Good night. <laughs>